Cliff Twemlow is like the the unknown soldier of DIY British independent film. I mean, there's a lot of, of obscure British indie filmmakers, DIY filmmakers throughout the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. Uh, you know, one-off guys like M Michael J. Murphy who made so many films. But Twemlow is more obscure than Michael J. Murphy. Twemlow is kind of like a renaissance man. He's uh, actor, stuntman, uh, author of books, composer of music, um, what, what do you call bodybuilder, doorman, bouncer, tuxedo warrior, but he also has the eye of Satan. I've been I've been wanting to do a video on Twemlow for 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 years. Ever since I I learned about him, I, I listened to the uh, to a great podcast, almost like documentary, uh, on him on this uh, this Adventures in VHS podcast. One wonderful podcast, still available on the website. Uh, and this this podcast was like a documentary on the life of this guy uh, Cliff Twemlow and his works. Uh, you know, all of his in incredible works and uh, there's, there was also a, a whole book about Cliff, uh, Cliff Twemlow I'm going to try to get his name right there was a whole book, uh, which is out of print, but now you can get it on, on Amazon Kindle, uh, really inexpensively. Um, uh, Twemlow's uh, life, I mean, he started off, you know, kind of doing all kinds of jobs, being a, a bouncer, a uh, doorman, what he called a tuxedo warrior. Then he started doing extra work in television series, and he, and he worked himself into doing music, doing composing music music for uh, stock music libraries and uh, he couldn't he couldn't he couldn't play music. He couldn't. He didn't know musical notations, how to write notes. Apparently, he would just hum the music into a tape recorder, and he would have somebody else transcribe it. And uh, he had this career in, in doing music. He did music for a lot of British television series. His music uh, found its way into it. Um, I, I guess his most well-known piece of music he he composed under the uh, under the pseudonym Peter Reno, I believe. And one of his most well-known compositions found its way into Dawn of the Dead. Yes, he composed uh, uh, I'm a Man. Cause I'm a man. Cause I'm a man. He also, in, in the early 70s, um, got himself into a little bit of trouble because he, um, he composed uh, this, uh, this, this song uh, called Live and Let Die. And uh, and it was he, he he it was released before the actual movie Live and Let Die, and uh, I mean according to him Live and Let Die is just a title you know it didn't have anything to do with James Bond. Uh, the the broccolis and um, uh, wings and Paul McCartney did saw things a little bit different, and uh, he got into a, a little bit of legal trouble uh, with that and got uh, sued and and uh, uh, he, Cliff Twemlow's Live and Let Die was pulled off the market. And so there were, the 70s were kind of a lean, a number of lean years for Cliff Twemlow. He, you know, went back to uh, bouncing and doormen and being what we call the tuxedo warrior, uh, uh, that type of thing. And uh, rebuilt his body, got heavy into nutrition, bodybuilding, and he actually wrote a a, a book, kind of a, an autobiographical autobiogra uh, work, Tuxedo Warrior. And they made a film out of it at the, the end of the of the seventies. They made a film out of Tuxedo Warrior. They shot it in Zimbabwe uh, for the the exchange rate with the the uh, British currency in Zimbabwe. They were able to to uh, to to make a, an economical movie in Zimbabwe, but. But the, it was it was it was Tuxedo Warrior in name only. That movie it was more of like a Casablanca kind of. Uh, it was just a fictional thing. Cliff Twemlow was not the star of the film. He had a little tiny part in it, but he he came back from that experience uh, like I'm gonna go and do something. I'm gonna make you know uh, a, a hell of a movie. So he took the money. 
that he made with Tuxedo Warrior. And he he rang up this guy, uh, David Kent Watson, who was a in the sound library. But he, he, he met him back in Grenada Television when he was doing uh, 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 extras work there. And, and they had... He, um, Watson had, had uh, started up his own uh, studio, recording studio, and they, they, they collaborated, and I think he recorded a lot of music at the studio, and they were, they were working, so they kind of pooled their resources, and they shot this, this movie called GBH, Grievous Bodily Harm, and they shot it not on film, they didn't have enough money for film, but they shot it on, on video. And this is this is really this is the early '80s now. They're shooting on video, and they were pioneers in in the early shot on video feature films, because all over the world, in the early '80s, the world was starting to change. Technology was starting to change. The home video boom was exploding. Was happening in front of everybody, and there were a few people here and there in the U.S. It was those people of uh, the. Um, uh, Christopher Lewis and Linda Lewis, the, the husband and wife, I believe, who were making stuff like Blood Cult uh, and uh, that um, uh, the Ripper, that Tom Savini Ripper film. So they were doing shot on video. In UK, they were doing shot on video stuff. There was a, there was a film which, um, which, which uh, Severin just re-released on video, uh, Suffer Little Children, which is kind of a notorious film. And GBH... GBH, Grievous Bodily Harm, uh, so named after uh, uh, English criminal law, which is uh, GBH is the most severe form of assault. Uh, GBH was billed uh, on the on the VHS cover as um, uh, more more extreme. It, it's it's was something more extreme than uh, the Long Good Friday. You know, kind of like uh, Massacre Mafia style when when they were like, it's more it's more powerful than The Godfather. You know, that was what this guy and Twemlow himself kind of sound. He kind of sometimes comes off as a as a British as an uh, as a Manchester version of Duke Mitchell in some way. I mean, uh, GBH is just a tough guy story about a guy who I think he gets out of prison and 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 just starts on a on a bloody rampage through the. Uh, through the British underworld. Keller's back. Took over the rainbow rooms last night. Tevis came in on the doorman, wiped the floor. When I say go, you'll cripple the bastard. My club next, the zoo. If Keller wants something, he takes it. I want that club, do you understand? Nobody can stand up to Keller. There is one man who can stand up to him. Oh yeah, who's that? The Mancunian. So GBH was the beginning. GBH was a, apparently a big hit, a big success. And so the star, Cliff, the star producer, Cliff Twemblow, and the director, uh, uh, David Ken Watson, embarked on this whole string of mostly shot on video action sci-fi horror films throughout the 80s and the early 90s. This tough guy, casting himself as in these like rough and tumble personas and he's on these like in exotic locales and these beaches and he made a film called the Ibiza Connection and he made all of these some there were a lot of movies which they didn't finish which they couldn't finish uh um they made this movie uh called Predator the Quietus also known as as Moonstalker where he played he played a character named Cain uh, and uh, oh, and then he also made the, he wrote this novel called The Pike, which is kind of like Jaws, but he says he, according to Twemlow, he had the idea like years before Jaws, and so he was going to make this movie Pike, and they had this animatronic Pike, and they were going to have Joan Collins in the movie, and um, but the financing fell through. A lot, a lot, a lot of Cliff Twemlow projects. You see them. Uh, there's a lot of little clips of them on YouTube. They're just like trailers or promotional trailers, and they never made the full film. Uh, but they did make Predator: The Quietus, uh, aka Moonstalker, which is a different Moonstalker than the U.S. film. I always thought for years Predator: The Quietus and uh, Quietus and the the U.S. Moonstalker were different, but I, they're they're different, I, I believe. I don't know. It's 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 weird in the, in the world of 
Cliff Twemlow. There's not a lot of documentation. You kind of got to find your own path. Uh, but after Moonstalker, which I believe was 1986, also these films have different, the production years of them are all kind of screwed up because they were, they weren't re as much released, it just kind of escaped. And they, they were, they showed up on video here and there in different parts of Europe. So difficult to kind of get a, a, a timeline of what they, you really got to, I guess you got to read the book. You got to read the Cliff Twemlow book. But, um, like, Moonstalker, Predator of the Quietus was like 1986, and then in, around 87, they did this Eye of Satan. And uh, Eye of Satan, is it's the first move, Cliff Twemlow movie that I've watched, by the way. I just want to make that clear. It's difficult to watch Cliff Twemlow movies. The, you know, it's in the U.S. They never were released on VHS. They never were available here. Uh, so it's you got to rely on, uh, you know, it's they're starting to show up on YouTube. A really good copy of GBH just showed up on YouTube not that long ago. And the Eye of Satan, a, real, a good, uh, I believe, Dutch copy for, with, with subtitles. Titles uh, from the Dutch VHS showed up, and uh, so I, I, I sat down. I'm like, I want to watch my first. Cl I, I'd watch clips and I'd listen to the documentary, and I'd, I'd see. I, I knew the whole. I knew the whole scene. I knew the whole Cliff Twemlow scene, but nothing prepared me for the Eye of Satan, which is just this kind of action paranormal horror kind of mishmash. There's a main plot surrounding uh, British mobsters double-crossing Middle Eastern gunrunners. In the middle of it, there's a British mobster's beautiful daughter who is a beautiful and impulsive character who is kidnapped by the Middle Eastern terrorist. And then all into this plot, you just drop this guy Kane, who is again, it was the same, who is the same character name from uh, from uh, uh, Predator: The Quietest, but I think it's a different different person. Uh, Kane is this kind of um, uh, satanic um, monster with a panther who goes around collecting money for mobsters. It, it's 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 very very weird. There's some kind of slasher scenes. There's some scenes in in uh, in in uh, churches that are very well shot and well done. And uh, and the, and uh, the, so Cain is running around. Cain ends up protecting the mobster's daughter, and all surrounding this. Uh, this guy, the Cain, he's shooting people up, and he goes and messes some mobsters up and uh and then there's all and there's this guy who's kind of controlling Kane because he has the eye of satan which is just this this mysterious kind of oracle th that that Kane is trying to to uh to steal so he can get ultimate power and it's kind of it's it's a real big it's a real mishmash of action and and uh, and and horror and GBH style kind of mobster stuff, you know, kind of British mobster type stuff. But it's it's surprisingly well made, you know. I mean, it's a shot of video film, but it's shot with like dollies and you know, very uh, cinematically uh, photographed and well lit for given the the technology of circa. 1987, 88. It's listed in the IMDb as 1992, so I don't know. Uh, Twemlo, you could see immediately the persona of Twemlo in this film. I, I, I mean, you could tell he just is this charismatic character off the screen. He, you know, he, he, you could just tell. You could just tell. He's playing this demonic character. Half the time he has these green, kind of greenish contact lenses in. But he, he's also showing off his his bodybuilding a lot because he's an older gentleman. But he's 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 swole up. He's swole in this film. And there's even a scene where he's uh, you know for some reason he you see him extended kind of uh, greased uh, oiled up body scene. It's a different kind of look because most of the time witches and warlocks they're kind of especially in modern era they're more kind of uh, you know stream streamlined they're they're thinner and just kind of more 
kind of drawn in. So to have this kind of big, bulky, kind of demonic guy, it, it, it's it's kind of like, well, okay. I mean, it's a different type of look, really. <laughs> you know, you wonder why why if he if he can do all this stuff and material dematerialize and do all this kind of magic stuff. Why is why why does he uh, why does he need guns? Why does he shoot people? In fact, there's a scene later in the film where he's like, he gives the girl the gun. It's like, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna have some fun and just play. Well, it's it's okay, all right. <laughs> it's 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 just a, it's a fun movie, and there's also this, you know, the 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 subplot. These two uh, police detectives who are, you know, uh, trailing him on on the trail. Good acting, solid acting, unusually good acting. But again, you know, it's all British. It's an English movie. So, uh, so you know, to to us uncultured Americans, it, it all appeals. Oh, that's great acting. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it seems great to me. I mean, the performances, even the two police detectives, the way it's shot in the cinematic manner, halfway through the movie, you're like, this doesn't really make a lot of sense, though. This is just, I mean, there's some very talky scenes with these guys talking about Middle Eastern uh, politics and gun running and all this stuff. And then, and then there's a panther which, uh, I, I, I don't know, you don't know what's going on with the panther. Is he turning into the panther? You know, it seems like there's five shots of the panther and they're like, uh, they're always uh, off screen. Oh, hey, look, there's the panther. You know, <laughs> it's, kinda, it's a very low budget way to do a panther. But then the film ends in a very thrilling note with that panther. <clears throat> Very well done. I mean, you can watch the trailer. If, I mean, if you're not into Twemlo, you can watch the trailer. And the trailer sells this. That's why I wanted to watch. That's why I hunted this movie out for years. I watched because the trailer is like this. No one knows. It's such a no. It's such a the the, the spooky narrator and everything. You're like, man, this is gonna be like the best movie ever made. <laughs> An indestructible killer, the ultimate assassin, lover. Who are you? He is the eye of Satan. And, and, then, and then you're like, you watch the movie, and you're like, everything in the trailers in the movie. But it's just, but there's all this stuff in in the middle of it. So, uh, but but it, it, but you keep watching it because it's just it's compulsively watchable. Twemlow is compulsively watchable. It's it's done in such a cinematic way that it doesn't, even though it's shot on video, it doesn't come off as as ugly in, in a way. It keeps you hooked, you know, even if you you got to go through some of the boring patches, which is you know almost. Uh, unavoidable given the low budget nature of it you gotta pad it out a little bit but the the ending the the final showdown between between uh uh kane and and then where he just basically takes on everybody he takes on all the mobsters and there's all these double cross and the subplots and blah 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 blah, blah. but it's a, a thrilling movie it's a thrilling thrilling movie got me excited about watching more Cliff Twemlow, definitely. I, I mean, it's such an interesting story. I mean, the, the persona of Cliff Twemlow. And I mean, I think there's a problem with a lot of his movies and that the fi the financing and the distribution and then some of his movies are in distribution hell. They're just kind of uh, in the throes of uh, these these big distributors and the, the right, there's rights problems. But it would be wonderful if somebody like Severin Films could kind of untangle the rights mess and at least release stuff, something like The Eye of Satan and GBH and get these things out here and interview interview the people involved in these films while some of them are, are still out there. Because I think the story of Cliff Twemlow, it's such an, an interesting story, such an obscure story. And, all, and, and a lot of these shot on video filmmakers, uh, you know, worldwide, there's all, this is, there was this whole era of, of filmmaking quote in air quotes I guess could you he might consider it video making uh, but I would consider it filmmaking there was a whole cinematic era of people of pioneers
pioneers of shot on video people, and now every film is a shot on video film, essentially. You know, every film you look at is digital, is shot on video, shot on video. You know, it, they used to be such a, uh, you know, a scarlet letter, v, v, V for video, the scarlet V, you know. But now it's all, it's all changed. The world has changed. And these guys, these pioneers in, in, in the era, they've kind of been forgotten. They've been thrown aside. And the films, you know, they're analog video, so, um, you know, they're never going to look better. They're always going to be stuck in this analog prison of, of standard definition, murky analog video. But there are some films which have a, a great deal of quality. And the, a lot of Tuomo's films, you just look at the trailers, look at the Eye of Satan. I mean... They're, they're great. They're wonderful films. And, and they, I, I just want, it would be wonderful to, to get these things out somehow in a special edition. It would be just, I think, a treat. A treat uh, and a surprise for, for many people who probably don't even know that these, that these films exist. So, in the meantime, you can check them out, check the clips out, check the full movies out uh, on YouTube. Uh, they, oh, you know, and if, you know, keep circulating the tapes, I guess, keep circulating the YouTubes. If anybody has the Cliff Twemlow, yeah, definitely uh, get it out there because uh, I think uh, a lot of people would be interested in watching these things. On behalf of the motion picture industry, welcome to the world of home video entertainment.